Hello friends, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Erin and if this is your first time here, welcome to Booked and Busy. Today's video is going to be a new releases reading vlog. I decided to pick up a number of new releases and read them with you all today. We've got a couple different dramas. We've got romance, we've got fantasy, we've got mystery, and we've got horror. So I'm quickly going to tell you about the five books that I'm going to be reading in today's vlog and then we're going to just get into it. So the first book that I'm going to be reading is Finley Donovan, uh, Jumps the Gun by El Casamano, which is the third book in the Finley Donovan series. It is a cozy mystery series about this mom, this Finley Donovan, who accidentally gets hired as a hitman when she's pitching her novel to her editor. I'm reading Secretly Yours by Tessa Bailey. Um, this is the first book in a romance duology, small town, second chance, rom-com type of story. We've got the eighth book in the Wayward Children series is Lost in the Moment and Found by Shana McGuire. This is a portal fantasy world where we follow children who have gone through doors to other worlds and they either we experience them in their worlds or they congregate at Eleanor West home for Wayward Children. Seven Faceless Saints by MK Love, which is a YA fantasy that I was really intrigued by the cover and then I found out it was YA and I said okay I'm still gonna give it a shot and then last but not least one of my most anticipated releases of the year we've got How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrick which is a, his most recent horror release and this is like a haunted house story so I'm really looking forward to all of these books and we have some interesting things to talk about so let's get into the vlog shall we friends i have finished the first book for this vlog and i am halfway through the second so let's talk about the book that i finished first i just finished finley donovan jumps the gun which is the third book in the finley donovan series and this is in a lot of ways a return to form in finley donovan's killing it um because finley donovan knocks him dead really didn't do much for me starting out right at the gate oh this is a lot more humorous than book two i found uh i enjoyed this one this one takes place in a more isolated setting and a more limited time frame so in this one we follow finlay and her sidekick slash nanny slash accountant vero as they attend this political this police citizens academy for the for a week and um they are trying to solve the mystery of who easy clean is and they are continuing to be roped into the assassin for hire working with the mob type of environment um i enjoyed this one more than i enjoyed book one but i don't know that i excuse me more than i enjoyed book two but i don't think it was quite at the level of book one for me because there's only one more book in the series i think it's going to be a quartet and i do think the core mystery uh is going to be wrapped up in this fourth book i will read it and i will borrow it from the library the same that i did with this one but ultimately i have a lot of issues and i think most of my issues i'm realizing in book two and book three come down to vero i think that the things that vero does kind of are unrealistic for the the role that she has in their life um and i think that finlay gives vera a lot of freedom and a lot of leeway and i think that that isn't always the best choice like the fact that vera gambles away the money the fact that vero has like a warrant out for her arrest and she didn't disclose that especially as someone who is caring for your children and is living in your home like even if it's for a misdemeanor type of thing even if it's like a thing that you didn't do i do think those are things that you should disclose and i think that vero herself has gotten finley in a lot of trouble and at one point finley points out she's like so you were willing to help me like hide a dead body or whatever and like participate in possible crimes with me but you didn't feel like you could share with me that there was a warrant out for your arrest and like things like that and it just it, it gets to be a bit ridiculous at a point because uh i, I do I, i'm happy that steven um uh finley's ex-husband was not as much of a character in this book and i also the same thing that i felt about the book too is i don't think there was enough of her writing the book like finley while she's doing all these things she's supposed to be an author and she does not spend a lot of time working on this book and i know that she obviously has you know more pressing concerns given her dealing with the mob and you know people trying to kill her husband and all these other things but i feel like some of the charm of book one was seeing how the real life things that were happening were influencing the book and i feel like book one was the book where we got the most of her actual writing process and how her life was was uh playing out on the page and i thought it was really interesting and at this point it feels like her actual her career as a novelist really is just on the back burner and is forgotten about quite a bit 
um so while i do think if you enjoy book one you'll enjoy this one i think it was much better than book two ultimately i don't think the the magic is there for me anymore so i don't think i'll be continuing to collect this series but i will probably re if it goes beyond book four then i probably won't continue but if book four is gonna be the last one and the things are gonna be wrapped up then i will uh, i do appreciate the little bit of a plot twist there was at the end there and i thought that was very intriguing um and there were some interesting reveals but ultimately it's not doing much for me The second book that I have started is Lost in the Moment and Found by Shauna McGuire. This is book eight in the Wayward Children series. I am 50% of the way through this one. This is a very short read, so I'm only like 80 pages in, but this is a novella. This is the latest installment in the Wayward Children series by Shauna McGuire. I've read most of the books in this series, but I have a couple that I'm holding out on reading for specific blogs. Um, I'm already liking this significantly more than I liked uh, Where the Drowned Girls Go. In uh, this one, we follow Antoinette or Ancy, who is a young girl and she loses things. And in the beginning of the novel, there is a content warning that, uh, that I think is really uh, appropriate. It also makes me really feel for the author. But it just lets you know that nothing too bad is going to happen and Ancy is going to run away before things can get too bad. And so we follow this young girl at the beginning of the novel and she loses, or the novella, she loses her father. And shortly after, her mom gets into a new relationship and she gets remarried. And this new man in her is sowing discord between her and her mother. And he is like on the precipice of trying to, you know, institute some type of inappropriate relationship with Ancy. And because of that, she kind of can see the, the writing on the wall. And she's like seven, maybe six, if that. And she runs away and she goes to this pawn shop. And that pawn shop is a door to this world where lost things go. And uh, losing, being lost and found, obviously, are heavy themes in the book because he's like, This is the day that I, I realized that my mom wouldn't always believe me. And this is the day that I, I lost my safe place. And this is, uh, I didn't realize that I lost the, you know, trust that I would be believed when I would say things. And so uh, I think some of it has to do with like childhood innocence and the loss of innocence and realizing the world is a different place than the insular space you've been led to believe when you're a young child. And some of it has to do with like shitty parenting if we're just calling a spade a spade. Um, and I really appreciate the gentleness in which these things are being handled. Like always, Shana McGuire's writing uh, is very poignant and very delicate and she really handles tough topics with a lot of grace and a lot of empathy and that just like jumps off the page. Um, I'm really enjoying how this is being written and we've also got to like see glimpses of other worlds through these stories and we're continuing to expand the lore and the the like mythos of this world because we're now seeing that when you're in your youth and you're this age like multiple doors can open up to you and you can go to multiple places even if it's not your world and so we're watching Auntie as she is starting to trust herself a little bit more and we're seeing like where her instincts guide her because obviously her instincts led her to run away from home because she knew that she was in a place that was unsafe and she could see that but when it came down between her and this man her mother would believe this man and i do think some of that has to do with grief and poor decision making and you know uh wanting to see the best in people and being in a vulnerable state in life but it, like you should always believe your kid like period um but that's another topic for another day but i am really really enjoying this i'm about to head out and go get my nails done and like while i'm getting my pedicure i'm pretty sure i'm gonna finish this up so i'll be back with my final thoughts on this one hi my friends it is later on the same day i went and got my hair done got my nails done it was my bestie's birthday today so i took him out to dinner and i thought i would update you all on my reading so I finished Lost in the Moment and Found, and I ended up giving it three stars. I enjoyed this one. The plot kind of picked up quite a bit, and like I would say the majority of the plot of this one is in the latter half of this novel, or this novella. I love how it ended with um, Antoinette finding her way to Eleanor West's Home for Wayward Children, and I do hope to see her again in future installments, but I do think that this is kind of 
similarly to family donovan i do think this is an end of the road with this series for me i think for me specifically it's lost a little bit of the magic and i think that some of the magic came from when i was originally reading them like back to back because i started reading this series in 2021 i really enjoyed it um but i'm finding that i'm not as moved by the stories now like i gave this one three stars i enjoyed it but for this to be 23 dollars for like this little novella i think that my days of collecting the series are probably over and maybe i'll pick them up from the library read them there and then if i like it i'll buy it but it's getting to be almost rinse and repeat but like with a different set of issues which i don't particularly mind it's just for the cost of essentially a full you know a full novel for something that takes so little time to read um and you know my investment in a series mainly comes from getting to know new character getting to know the characters and following following them throughout their lives and throughout whatever you know situations are happening throughout the series but this one is almost like starting a new series and in, in, in a lot of the novels like a, my favorite characters are probably Jack and Jill and we do see them a couple times but this series isn't focused on them it's focused on the home it's focused on the doors it's focused on the children as a whole and because of that I, I find it difficult to get invested I think that um the one that had the most emotional impact on me is still every heart of doorway because it was my first entry into the world and it, it brought me to tears at the end and i think that the one that i enjoyed the most overall and that i still think about the most is in an absent dream which is blundy's story maybe when we finally get around to kate's story and or and or if some of the future stories follow characters that i'm already interested in rather than new people that we've not met before or people that I, I, we've only met in passing that i'm not invested in then maybe i'll pick up those but i think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis if it's someone and or if it's a world that i'm interested in picking it up and reading but i don't don't think I'll continue to be uh, faithful to this series in the way that I have been the last couple of years because the most recent two installments I haven't particularly enjoyed. So that's Lost in the Moment and Found and I also started another book while I was getting my nails done. Um, I was going to pay here and I have plenty of time to read so I am 100 pages into How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. This is the latest novel from this author, another January release like all of the other books in this video. In this one, we follow our main character, Louise, who we start the novel five years prior when she finds out that she's pregnant and she's worried about how to sell her parents. And this is a novel that is focused on grief and the stages of grief and acceptance, or the stages of grief. And that's kind of how the sections are broken up. We start, uh, and each of the sections is marked by like a black page. So we start off with denial and then we go to anger and we continue to follow the story in that manner and um this is what i've learned from the first 100 pages that i've read is that i don't just dislike sister dynamics i actually probably don't really care much at all for sibling dynamics in general and i do have siblings but i was raised as an only child so maybe my apathy toward that type of relationship dynamic comes from my upbringing i don't know but i don't find the relationship dynamic to be particularly engaging or interesting to follow nor do i find the exploration of that to be particularly interesting i will say other than like this being about a haunted house and being the latest Grady Hendrix, I didn't know very much about this going into it. I just knew that it was a new Grady Hendrix. I wanted to read it after having loved Southern Book Club's guide. And this is supposed to come out in July of last year. But um, what it is about actually is we're finding out that this main character, Louise, this is not a spoiler, it's in a synopsis that at the beginning of the novel, her parents are both killed in a car crash and the way that they die the order in which they die means that her circumstances are not what she assumed that they would be upon the death of her parents and uh we see her visit their home mom was a hoarder she collected like dolls and and puppets and things like that and she but she also was like a puppeteer so that was part of the reason and some suspicious things have happened like the tv is turning on seemingly on its own dolls have been moved um when se there seems to be no one home and she attributes some of it to like faulty wiring or to her brother playing tricks on her something like that but we as the reader can immediately see that there is something a little bit more sinister going on and we know that there there's some type of haunting also 
it's right there on the cover there's something going on in the house um i think that for me my enjoyment of grady Hendrix. this is my third grady Hendrix. the first one i read was uh the final girl support group which i didn't like at all uh, i think i may have gave it two or three stars and then i read final girl i read the southern book club's guide which i gave five stars and now i'm reading this and i think that my enjoyment also hinges on whether or not i like the main character that we're following and also a trend i was having this discussion with someone about riley sager but of the three Grady Hendrix books that I've read, they all seem to follow middle-aged women. And I think that's an interesting choice. I know that following women is a genre convention of mystery thriller, but to my understanding, this is a horror, so I don't, because I'm not as well versed in that genre, I don't know if the genre conventions are the same in horror as they are in like mystery thrillers, but it is something worth noting. Uh, I don't feel any particular way about Louise. Um, Louise is you know like 39 40 she has a five-year-old daughter and she has a less than some relationship with her daughter's father but they co-parent just fine but her relationship with her brother is very lacking and we see a lot of tension from them as they are trying to sort out their parents last will and testament their funeral arrangements and the house and the things to do with that and we see a lot of tension in their relationship as a result of that i don't know where the story is going because the way the last little bit that i read would lead me to believe is that louise is about to go back home to california and uh this book is set in charleston i think primarily and i feel like the last book was also set in charleston so maybe great Hendrix is from that area and that's the area that he knows best because um he seems to set several of his novels in that area but overall this is fine i'm not compelled to read it i am going to continue reading it a for this vlog b because i loved southern book club so much it was one of my favorite books of last year i really want to love this one uh, i picked it up you know prior to release day i got a signed copy i'm invested i want it i want grady Hendrix to be a favorite author of mine rather than like a one hit wonder i want it to be like someone i know at least one horror book is going to come out every year and I'm going to be invested in it and I'm going to have a good time. So I do still have two other books from him on my TBR, My Best Friend's Exorcism and Horror Star. So even if this one isn't a hit for me, I will continue to read more from him. So that is this update. We've got one book down and I'm making about a fourth of the way through the next one so i will check in with you all when i have more thoughts maybe around the 50 percent mark maybe when things actually start to pick up and the horror elements like come to fruition in the story but until then
and welcome to a new little mini series that's gonna exist in a few of my vlogs over the course of the year and it's gonna be making my house into a home so every single year since I started college so for the last 10 years I've moved every year and because of that I haven't taken the time or put a lot of money or energy into making my house a home but when I moved into this place I knew that I would be here for a while and so um, I finally decided that I wanted to put that time and effort into making my space a space that I love coming to and I decided I wanted to start with my bedroom. The people over at Brooklyn and had a little fly on the wall and they thought that they would help me out with this project. Uh, so they sent me these lovely sheets and this duvet cover that you would have seen in the bureau for me to um, have the like luxurious hotel sleeping experience from the comfort of my own home. When you get out into the world, you realize that the most commonplace home things are extremely expensive and sheets and bedding are no exception. Um, high quality sheets and bedding can cost upwards of $500. And while Brooklyn is still expensive, it cuts out the middleman and you get that hotel sleeping experience for less than half the price. They have these hardcore luxe bundles that you can get a fitted sheet, a flat sheet, um pillowcases and all that for up to 200 and 250 dollars and they have a lot of different color combinations where you can mix and match up to 20 different colors to get your perfect mix as you see i have this like butter toffee shade uh for my duvet cover and pillows and then i kept it with a classic like hotel white uh i love 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 white bedding but i wanted to step out of my comfort zone a little bit and get something a little bit jazzier uh to go with my new bed so i am going to show you some of the different options that you can choose from if you want to choose your own bedding when you're choosing a bundle you're going to get a better deal putting those things together than getting them individually so you have two options to choose from the classic hardcore or the luxe hardcore i went with the luxe hardcore bundle and i had quite a time trying to figure out what combination i wanted to do if i wanted to do one single color or if i wanted to mix and match i did end up mixing and matching because i was like let's step outside the box a little bit but as you build your bundle you can choose different colors and combinations for the different elements of your sheet so obviously I have a queen size bed and they even have some limited edition things that are different now than when I was ordering probably because we're tiptoeing in the spring um, but I was going to start with the all white then they have a graphite a cream this window pane and then a like striped option and my previous bedding was a striped option so I really considered those but then you can mix it up with this sage color I actually really like this like abstract um, design I think that would go really well with the toffee but me being a classic gal I of course went with the solid white and then you have more options when you go to choose from your duvet and this is one of the great things is that you can customize your bedding uh, as many different ways as you like because depending on when you go on the website you have a lot of different options to choose from so continuing on with that limited edition set if you wanted this the sage the abstract the basil the warm gray you can go with that i think i would mix it up if i were to be purchasing something right now and i would probably go with the um abstract color i think it's really neat um and gonna continue on with that solid white but there are so many different combinations that you can make depending on you know what you like of course so I still have a full queen size bed, gonna put with the abstract like that. And then you have that same option with pillowcases. So when you buy standard sheets, everything is the exact same. You have the same pillowcases, um, uh, fitted sheet, flat sheet, all that is gonna be the same. But one of the benefits of Brooklinen is that you can customize your bundle to your heart's desire. You can choose what size pillows you want, and you can continue to select what what colors that are available that match your sheets or differ from that if you want to mix it up. So because I got the abstract, I'm gonna, I'm a you know pretty simple gal. I'm gonna go with standard size, solid weight, and the abstract, which is what I had previously. 
and then you see your three different options so if you have three different opportunities to customize with the sheet set the duvet cover and the pillowcases and then you're all set um and i mentioned in my previous vlog i wanted to focus a lot more on self-care this year and i work really hard i work quite a lot i'm up at five in the mornings and i have 10 hour work days and so the way that i set myself self up for success in my workday is having a great night's sleep so that includes going to bed on time but also having a bed and sheets that create a luxurious sleeping experience i spent the last couple of nights on my brooklyn and sheets and i swear to you the sleep that i've been getting is unmatched um the quality of the materials is so silky and so lush uh and i love like slipping into my pajamas after i freshly showered and sliding in between the sheets it's uh, been re a really great experience and i think that you too deserve this quality sleeping experience if you don't believe me, check out the Brooklyn website and read the more than 100,000 five-star reviews for yourself. And you can see that everyone that invests in Brooklyn feels like they're getting a massive return on their investment. If you look at like the time, like a third of your day is spent sleeping and you deserve for your sleeping experience to be top notch. So make sure you check out the link in my description. Friends, if you're interested in checking out Brooklyn for yourself, use my code booked and busy to get $20 off your order of $100 or more. And I want to thank them so much for sponsoring this portion of today's video. Since we last spoke, I have completed another novel and that is Secretly Yours by Tessa Bailey. This is the first book in like a new sisters or a new duology from this author and prior to reading this Tessa Bailey has been an autobi author for me I read uh it happened one summer in 2021 absolutely loved it and then and I at the end of that year she put out an indie which was window shopping loved that one as well and then we get to her 2022 releases and I DNF hook line and sinker which was the second book in the Bellinger sister series and then she put out um like a mystery novel which I liked and then she came out with happenstance which I thought was fine but I wasn't compelled enough to finish it and so this is kind of the make it or break it book and sadly we didn't make it we broke it um I gave this book two stars didn't love it um and I I asked myself prior to me reading it happened one summer I wasn't very aware of Tessa Bailey's releases so I can't say if this is a new thing for her or if this has always been the case but she's putting out these novels back to back like the second book in this series I want to say comes out in either April or June so that's like four to six months between and then she just had a release like three months ago with happenstance and I wonder if the if it's a quantity over quality thing because this romance was very lacking to me uh it was very lackluster um it's kind of pitched as grumpy it's it's pitched as grumpy sunshine but Julian honestly isn't that grumpy he has like ocd and he has compulsions and he uh has gone through some trauma and so as a result he's tried to like reg have a like a regimen that keeps him calm and both of these people in this book really just deal with a lot of anxiety and i've said this without characters before but i think that a therapist would be more helpful to them as a as a unit than love would be uh our main like our main female character Hallie she is reeling after the death of her grandma and she uh, isn't really processing it well and she is acting out and she is trying to she's struggling to figure out what her identity is now that she isn't being centered by her grandma because she had a less than traditional upbringing that left her with some emotional scars and so she's trying to figure out who she wants to be and she's like rebelling in that but she's like 30 so it's not the way you would think when it's like oh it's a teenage rebellion but this just i didn't find that julian and hallie had any chemistry this is not a slow burn it's not like enemies to lovers is not really second chance so it doesn't fit neatly into any trope which isn't a problem for me my problem is that honestly i thought it was quite silly and quite juvenile the way the like love letter component was was done and how she was withholding how she knew him and honestly it really didn't 
didn't make sense to me i didn't buy it when she said that they almost kissed like 12 to 14 years ago and she has been pining after him ever since and she's compared every man that she's ever met to this man that she met her freshman year of high school that she didn't date she didn't have a relationship with that she almost kissed but he didn't because she was too young and i just i find that really difficult to believe and i also struggle to believe that she would hold a grudge on him for not remembering a woman who he almost kissed 14 years ago like there's that's not a significant occurrence maybe it was significant to her because obviously she crushed on him for 14 years but to be angry and hold it against him and then to start writing love letters and when i tell you love letters i'm using that term very generously very loosely because it was like a self-help guide almost and it it was just it was very juvenile it, it just didn't do anything for me to be quite honest and the plot of this one saving this wine bar saving the family vineyard maybe uh doing the um flowers at the library i finished this book for the sole sake of deciding if it, see if we got better a and b to see if i will be reading future tessa bailey books from the library and i do think i will be getting future tessa bailey books from the library because this just lacked the spark and it lacked the execution and it wasn't really that funny uh, i wasn't a fan of the side characters like there's nothing about this book truly that worked for me and i hate that because just because of how much i loved it happened one summer and i'm like maybe it happened one summer was a fluke because the majority of the other tests i've not loved any other tests available that i've read as much as that one and i've been trying to recapture that magic ever since then and sadly i have not been able to so ultimately this is a two-star read this will be getting unhauled um not a fan so yeah hello my friends i just got home from running some errands and picking up uh, another new release to add to the video um and i came home to a package and i haven't ordered any things i thought i would unbox it with you all Revive Me Part 1, The Act. This is one of my favorite romances of last year. This is the second like love story in the New Haven series. The first one is Restore Me and that one follows Sloan and Dominique and the second one and this is like three parts is um, uh, Mallory and Chris. Y'all this is a five star. Was it a five star? I think it was a five star. Uh, yeah it was a five star because book going was a four star um uh, i'm so excited to have this oh my goodness thank you so much ellie girl um so yeah you saw my stacks at the bookstore you you know my process you know how this goes so i'm gonna go through quickly the four books that i picked up um three of the four actually are new releases so we'll see which if any get added to the vlog so the first one that i picked up is the one that i specifically went to the bookstore for and that is secretly yours by tessa bailey this is her latest romance and the start of a new series i think book one and book two of this like duet come out this year so i'm excited not to say this is like my last shot with tessa bailey but the first book that i read from hers it happened one summer i absolutely love five star read one of my favorite romances of 2021 and then the second book and that and, and i also read her christmas novella that was self-published um i can't think of the name of it right now window shopping love that one another five star then her 2022 releases which were um the first one was hook line and sinker which was a sequel to have one summer i dnf'd and then um after that it was 
the 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 one that I can't think of the name of it but it was the the like cozy romance murder mystery one I enjoyed that one's three stars and then her most recent indie release happened since I started it I didn't DNF it well I stopped DNF it because it just wasn't really doing anything for me so this is going to kind of be the one like I've actually not heard the best reviews um I've seen Chandler read it and I saw Rachel from Raven Hair Reader she posted a reading vlog today where she was reading it but the things that they didn't like about it aren't things that I dislike and it's how like you know the man is really obsessed with her and they kind of fall for each other really quickly and it's like light grump sunshine but not too much so I'm hoping that this really works for me and then I picked up it's finally out of paperback and I've just heard nothing but great things about this book and that is How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu and like even my friend Steph is reading this recently like this is on so many people's favorite book of the year uh, and I just heard nothing but great things there it's a, it's a series of interconnected short stories about this like pandemic and not the end of the world but seemingly the end of the world and it's futuristic in nature it starts out in 2030 and it deals heavily with like themes of grief and as someone who has recently lived through a pandemic I am intrigued by fictional takes on the collapse of humanity and I know this one has to do with like melting permafrost and something you know coming out of that and I know that is also a thing that really could be in our near future as the polar ice caps melt as global warming continues things like that so eco fiction um is a like sub genre of fiction that I am finding more intriguing that I want to read more of so like this has several elements that I'm really intrigued by this next book was a book that I had on my radar, it was anticipated release, but I didn't know that it was YA. And so that is Seven Faceless Saints by M.K. Lott. But look at that cover. It is absolutely stunning. Um, so I may, who knows, I may read this in this vlog as well. So this one, um, religious themes, saints, all of that, like really following saints, angels, gods, that as a theme in fiction really does a lot for me. Uh, so this one, it says, the saints were merciful. All the stories said so, but the stories also said they crave blood. In the city of Ambrasia, saints and their disciples rule with terrifying and unjust power, playing favorites while the unfavored struggle to survive. After her father's murder at the hands of the Ambrasian military, Rosanna La Sertosa is willing to do whatever it takes to dismantle the corrupt system, tapping into her powers as a disciple of patience, joining the rebellion and facing the boy who broke her heart. As the youngest captain in the history of Palazzo security, Damian Venturi is expected to be ruthless and strong and to serve the saints with unquestioning devotion. But three years spent fighting in the never-ending Second War, saints have left him with deeper scars than he wants to admit, and a fear of confronting the girl he left behind. Now, a murderer stalks Umbrasia's citizens. As the body count climbs, the Palazzo is all too happy to look the other way. That is, until a disciple becomes the newest victim. With every lead turning into a dead end, Damien and Roz must dive into the underbelly of Umbrasia, where the pair will discover something more sinister and far less holy. I'm intrigued. And it, it claims to be perfect for anyone who loves morally great characters and fantasy tinged with horror. So really, really intrigued by this. And who knows, maybe you'll get my thoughts on this in this vlog. And then last, but certainly not least, another new release and that is the spite house by johnny compton this is actually by a black author and i didn't know that so um just when i saw it, i wasn't really intrigued by it but then i found out it was by a black author so then i was immediately more intrigued because there aren't nearly enough black authors writing or like writing horror fiction that gets really popular in my opinion um so this is also the literally dead book club pick for march and i had the opportunity to pick this one but because i didn't know it was by a black author i didn't pick it had I known, I would have picked it. Um, but either way, I'm excited to read this one. Uh, and I'm going to read you some opposite of this one because I think you might be a little bit more unfamiliar with this one as well. It says, Eric Ross is on the run from a mysterious past with his two daughters in tow. When he comes across a strange ad for the Masson House in Dejanor, Texas, Eric thinks they may have finally caught a lucky break. The most haunted place in Texas needs a caretaker. All we need to do is stay in the house and keep a detailed record of everything that happens there. 
provided the house's horrors don't drive them all mad like the caretakers before them. The job calls to Eric not just because there's a huge potential payout, but because he needs access to the secrets of the spy house. If it is indeed haunted, maybe it will help him understand the uncanny power that clings to his family, driving them from town to town, too afraid to stop running. And it's a gothic thriller, which really intrigues me, about grief and death and the depths of a father's love excited um i really enjoy exploring things of motherhood and so i feel like i could enjoy stories a story that focuses on fatherhood and i in the last year or so i've uh, realized that i really enjoy themes of grief in novels so i'm excited to see what's up with this one so here we have my little va oh, also happy valentine's day lovers um, your girl is Valentine less, but I did have a lovely dinner last night. Um, got dressed up, went out, had a great time, had a lovely dinner, so it's fine. Uh, hopefully, you know, next year I'll be booed up and we can celebrate. But here is the book haul. Friends, I have been putting off filming this update because I feel so many things. And the primary feeling that I have right now is just disgust and, you know, disbelief, let's say. Uh, as of right now, I am 70% into How to Sell a Haunted House, about 300 pages. I should be finishing this today. And when you hear someone say a horror book is disgusting, you might think, oh, that's really good. But it's, it's not that. It's not really good. I anticipate not only this being a one star read, but also this being on my worst, if not the worst book I read this year. Um, this synopsis is very misleading. Um, and I think that while it's not wrong, it leads you to believe different things about the nature of the haunted house than actually come to pass in the story. Um, this, the horror in here is very cartoonish. I think this would fit very well with Courage the Cowardly Dog and the other 9 p.m. and after shows on the Cartoon Network. Um, it's so unbelievable. Like, there is not enough space to suspend my disbelief to take this book seriously. And I do know that Grady Hendrix writes comedic horror. You know, I, this is my third book of his. Um, one that I didn't love, but it wasn't the worst thing I read. One that I absolutely loved was my favorite books of the year. And then this one. And the two that I have not liked have been his most recent releases, his 2021 release and his 2023 release. And this book is so unserious. Like, I'm just gonna tell you. So if you don't wanna, it's not a spoiler because I'm not gonna tell you the events, but I'm gonna tell you the what is haunting this house. So if you don't want to know, just mute me until I put the book down, okay? This house is being haunted by a puppet. A little arm puppet with his nubbins, his little nubby hands and feet and his little plastic head. And I know, you know, there have been doll horror like Annabelle and Chucky and things like that. Um, but just to, you know, you know, read you some of the things that this puppet says, I took some screenshots on my phone cause I'm, you know, reading this on my Kindle. And I just feel compelled to share them with you. Uh, there has been an imaginary spider dog attack. Um, the lady asked him, are you going to be good? Pumpkin, always good. He cooed everyone else bad. When he stood back up, he held something in his nubby little puppet arms. He began to sing his special song. Pumpkin here, pumpkin here, everybody laugh, everybody cheer. No more bath time, no more rules, no more teachers, no more schools. It's time to sing and dance all day. Pumpkin's here to play and play and play and play. 
and that's who you want me to believe is haunting this house terrorizing the parents terrorizing this young woman and young man attempting to murder them Like I talked about this on Instagram and honestly because I like stopped reading after that point last night. Sorry, my memory card was full. Um, you might be asking yourself, Aaron, why don't you just DNF it uh, if you're not enjoying it so much? And honestly, if I had not paid $28 full price for a signed copy of this book, I would DNF it. And if I wasn't reading it for this vlog and you know, I want to get the full story to share with you, um, but I know I'm going to be unhauling this immediately. Somebody's going to be very happy to get this on Pango Books. Uh, but I just, this honestly, this book is insulting my intelligence. It, it truly is. And I'm, this is, you know, made me question a lot of things about my own reading. I have definitely decided I will not be picking up any more Grady Hendrix books. Uh, I do have Horror Store and My Best Friend's Exorcism on my TBR. I still will read those eventually because I already own them. And who knows, maybe his older stuff will work for me. And this is the direction his recent releases are taking that isn't for me. But I'm also like, maybe horror as a genre isn't for me either. Because this book has such high reviews. I think it has like a 4.38 on Goodreads. Uh, and Mystery Thriller Horror Books tend to have lower ratings. Um, and every review is four and five stars. No, no, nothing but great things I see about it on Instagram and on Twitter. And I'm just like... If this is what the the peak and pinnacle of the horror genre is, maybe I don't need to be reading it because this is outside of my wheelhouse, my typical wheelhouse, and maybe I need to, you know, stay in my lane. So uh, I do have some horror books on my TBR, but I think going forward, I don't think I'll be picking up any horror books either. So this book has not only put me off this author, but has really put me off this genre. Uh, so don't expect to see much more horror going forward on my channel i mean obviously i'm going to read things that i own but i won't be adding any new things to my collection because this is so bad so i'm going to come back to you later on today when i have my final thoughts and to give you my full review for how to sell a hunt house but until then friends i have started the final book for this vlog and that is seven faceless things by mk law uh, I had this book on my radar for a little bit, uh, mainly because I saw the cover and the title and I was really intrigued by it. And while I was surprised to find out that it was a YA novel, I decided to still give it a go. And right now I am 125 pages in so that I can give you my initial impression. So this is a dual POV story set in like a medieval Italian type of setting and we follow these two characters Damien and Roz or Rosalinta and Damien is the son of this uh, general in this world but he is not one of the disciples so this world is based on these seven faceless saints but really they only worship six they've kind of erased the seventh from the history books and you know from the you know murals and things across the city uh, the chaos uh, saint and people who are born with some of the magic and the power of one of these saints are called disciples and the people that don't have this are called um, unfavored so Damien is an unfavored his father is a disciple so as an unfavored you are likely to be drafted into the war so um this is the second war of the saints or something like that and it has been going on for 20 years and the unfavored pepper the front lines the disciples are never chosen to go to war because they are the backbone of the economy because they have affinities to metals and to various things and they create things that are the primary export of this nation so um three years prior to the start of the novel damien and Roz were both unfavored and they were childhood friends and then he was sent off to war her both of their fathers were in the in the war but while damien's father rose up in the ranks to become the general uh Roz's father was a deserter and then when he was caught he was beheaded and his head was sent to 
uh, Roz and her mom's doorstep. And in that, also in that time, Roz is a late bloomer and she just finds out that she has uh, powers from the patient's disciple. And she is very, what's the one I'm looking for? She is, she doesn't really believe in her own religion and she doesn't think that it is fair that she has power and other people don't she doesn't think it's fair that um you know because she has these powers that she couldn't she didn't choose that she lives a life and that is you know exempt from these hardships that the other people face and things like that i'm not gonna lie um her little monologue and sh she's a bit whiny and it, it very much you know gave me the ick a bit because her logic and her her logic and her you know motivations are very childish uh, and they're both 20 um so you know uh but what is going on in this world is that three murders have happened two prior to the start of the novel and then one in like the prologue first chapter and one is of a disciple and so that's the one they decide to investigate but the two prior were unfavored and no one really uh put any effort into that rods is not a spoiler also works with like the rebel faction who are trying to antagonize the disciples and the palazzo which are like the security people who protect the disciples and they're trying i don't know what their exact aims are but they hope for you know equality and things like that for the unfavor and for them to have better living and working conditions i want to read y'all this little quote from Roz that really like gave me the ick um She says, the problem was Roz was good at the job. If she wanted to, she could create impeccable items. Somehow she knew that she barely tapped into her potential. The part of her that was descended from patients longed to do more, so much more, but the rest of her refused to give in to the euphoria her fellow disciples clearly felt when they used their magic. It wasn't fair that she had a comfortable life simply by virtue of being born into it. It wasn't fair that she got paid for doing a piss poor job of whatever the simple demanded. Not while Dev and his Sims family struggled to stay afloat. yeah so i feel like even in the current context of the story her motivations could be that because the disciples of patience make weapons you know that her father was fight fighting this useless war and that you know uh, these weapons are going to be used to kill other unfavor i feel like even right there there was a lot more reasonable and I don't want to say mature, but reasonable and mature motivations to be the way that you are. And the author addresses these other things. But rather than do that, you want to whine about what's not fair. Like, we know that life isn't fair, but just stomping your feet and just saying, I am going to squander my opportunity. Even though she also said that without this um, money from being a disciple, her mom would be starving, would be outside because she has been distraught ever since her father died and she's having episodes and so she can't work she doesn't leave the house and it's like even though all that is true you're not putting any effort into it knowing that this is the only thing that's keeping y'all out of the lion's den because your mom is also unfavored and so it's just and this is kind of the root of my issue with YA books uh but i'm, I'm still giving it a shot um also uh, so they have teamed up and when I say they've teamed up Ross has kind of blackmailed Damien into helping allowing him to forcing him to allow her to help him solve these murders um, she because she wants to know what happened to the unfavor and she wants to pump him for information for the rebel cause and he because he actually does care about what has happened to these people and he's investigating the deaths of the unfavor even though he's been directed not to and he feels a lot of pressure and he has like the threat of going back to the front lines over his head because he's been told that if he doesn't solve the murders quickly or the murder the one that they care about quickly he'll be back on the front lines so those are my initial thoughts. I'm about a third of the way through, but not quite. So yeah, I am gonna try and sit down and finish this today. It's a very quick read. I read all of that yesterday and I will come back to you with my final thoughts. 
I finished seven faceless saints. I took a couple of days or like a day and a half to sit on my thoughts and ultimately, oh my God, I'm gonna give this two stars. Uh, one thing I have learned in this vlog is that, um, you know, my, I, I learned some things that I don't like in books, not just in the books that I read them in, but overall. And what this confirmed for me is that I do not like murder mysteries in a fantasy setting. Uh, I, I remember reading that type of thing in The Justice of Kings. I read just one last year, didn't like it. And so this kind of cemented that that's something I don't like. I like a murder mystery novel, but murder mysteries in a fantasy setting or being the driving plot behind a fantasy does not intrigue me at all. I don't, I don't find that particularly interesting um this book is not for me uh i don't know that it does any particular thing well that i would actually recommend it for the kids i think they are more intriguing you know actual ya mysteries that don't take place in a fantasy setting i think that there are better books that explore religious themes and oppression and all those types of things than this um I think this is a new release that you can really pass on. Um, I found the exploration of religion to be underutilized and often very surface level for a world that is centered around religious oppression and these saints and how they impact daily life. I think that it was very underutilized. I think that it was a book where you essentially know exactly where it's going from the moment you start reading it so there is no mystery there's no intrigue to really keep you going and I definitely pushed myself through this one because I, it was a final book for this vlog and I didn't want to DNF the final book for this vlog but ultimately it didn't it didn't really do anything for me um I think the best thing about this book is the cover this is the first book in a series and while there's like a tiny sprinkle of intrigue with what happens at the end of this I could at any point in the reading process especially at the end but at any point in the reading process I could have stopped reading mid-sentence and been completely satisfied and not had a desire to know more because there is no intrigue and it's not because it's why there's no intrigue I just don't think this is particularly well written um you know this is a a pandemic book the author talked about writing it there um and i think that it just doesn't do much it, it's very unoriginal these characters this world this plot all of these are things that we've seen before and it didn't do anything interesting and this doesn't even have it going where it's like oh you know uh black indigenous or people of color black indigenous people people of color authors of color queer it didn't have any of those things going for it where it's like we haven't had these stories before by these groups of people it's not that it's not that either so there's nothing really remarkable about this to me nothing that would be like if you like this read this i, I don't there's nothing in it for me um so that brings me to the end of this vlog so i read Seven Faceless Saints, which I gave two stars. I read Secretly Yours by Tessa Bailey, which I gave two stars. I read How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix, which I gave one star. I read Lost in the Moment and Found by Shannon McGuire, which I gave three stars. And then last but certainly not least, I read Friendly Donovan Jumps the Gun, which I gave three stars. So as a whole, this new releases vlog wasn't <laughs> the best for me and didn't exactly turn out how I would have liked it to, uh, sadly. But I have read five at Finley Donovan 2023 releases and shared my thoughts with them with you all and I once again want to thank Brooklyn in for sponsoring today's video make sure you check out the link in my description you deserve the best night's sleep so make sure you check them out and if you have made it to the end of the video let us leave Let's leave a flower emoji for Secretly Yours because our main gal is a gardener and I will see you in my next one. Goodbye.